Look at that article, the video is there as well. Uh, on a brighter subject, let's go to the most interesting world, the world of high art uh, and, uh, and crime. What's better than beautiful art and the intrigue of crime? Anthony Mori, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, it's always a pleasure, Josh, thank you. Uh, listen, you're one of the top guys in the world. I've seen you on, I think, 60 Minutes and a host of other uh, national broadcasts on the issue of art and theft. Talk a little bit about your new book, uh, The Woman Who Stole Vermeer. Uh, and it's got a longer title than that. I, I'm not smart enough to know the entire title. Uh, talk about that new book. Well, thank you. I, I, I'll tell you that the title is long because this woman uh, that the book is about, a woman named Rose Dugdale, uh, her exploits are so remarkable. Um, in a nutshell, when you look at the history of the of art theft, and I'm talking about masterpieces, you know, works by artists everybody knows, things that are worth tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars, they're exclusively stolen by men, uh, except in the case of Rose Dugdale. And in 1974, this remarkable woman who was uh, born an heiress to uh, extreme wealth in Great Britain decided that she was going to de dedicate her life to supporting the Irish Republican Army, um, you know, sworn enemy of uh, rule in Great Britain um, and the United Kingdom. And she, uh, one of the things that she did was steal 19 paintings from the Rustborough House in Ireland, uh, including a Vermeer painting called uh, Woman Writing a Letter with Her Maid, which at the time was the biggest uh, art heist in terms of dollars in the history of the world, and for a woman to have done this, and for the reason she did it, um, it's just a remarkable story, uh, thus the long title. Um, uh, listen, you know art theft probably as much as anyone in the United States. Um, you're the director of security uh, at, the, um, at the Gardner, uh, the, the home of one of the most significant art thefts uh, of all time. How does this, th this exploit of her and stealing these 19 uh, paintings uh, compared to the Gardner theft? Well, you know, when, uh, when the Gardner was robbed in 1990, unfortunately, it, uh, the value of the items that were stolen, the 13 works, dwarfed any theft of any sort in the history of mankind. So it's hard to compare things in terms of dollar values. But I would say that the theft uh, about which I wrote this book um, involves outliers. So if you look at art theft history, um, these crimes fall into a certain um, category. They can all fit under this normal curve of who does them and why, basically, except her. She did hers for this strictly political reason that was well outside of her, um, of her rearing, of her birthright. And um, for a woman to have done it, she led this group into this home and because of her, she was an Oxford grad, a PhD, and because of her, her uh, wealthy upbringing, she knew what paintings to take because the Rustboro House has lots of masterpieces in it. Um, and then on top of that, Josh, the theft inspired future thefts. So that happened in 74. The Rustboro House was robbed again of basically the same paintings in 1986 and then two more times in the 2000s. So um, she really uh, broke the seal on the Rustboro House when she robbed it in 74. The Gardner, so give a little uh, compare and contrast. The Gardner Museum, despite it being the biggest theft in history of anything ever stolen, was kind of a bungled uh, theft, uh, despite the 13 works being taken out. There was other highly, highly valuable uh, pieces of art that they walked by and, and didn't grab as well. Was she a more sophisticated thief? Uh, well, that's a very good question. I would say she was. I think she would know masterworks better than the thieves who robbed the Gardner, although I'll say that um, what happened when the thieves uh, robbed the Gardner Museum is something that's common in the annals of art history, and that is the thieves went straight for the Rembrandts, because anybody watching right now or anybody who's past uh, freshman year of high school knows that Rembrandt is arguably the greatest artist and best known artist in history. And everyone can easily equate that with high value. So 
You can't go wrong stealing a Rembrandt. If you're a bad guy, I would strongly urge people not to steal Rembrandts. Um, but that's what they did when they came to the garden. They went directly for those. And in the room from which they took three Rembrandts and tried to take a fourth was also a Vermeer. And Vermeers are amongst the most valuable paintings in the entire world because of their beauty, um, their intrigue, and their rarity. Um, when she pulled off this heist in 74, how did she go about fencing, uh, disposing of the artwork in order to monetize it to be able to support uh, the political forces that she wanted to fund? Josh, that is the greatest question. I mean, that's the crux of all of this. Whenever somebody steals masterpieces like this, they believe they can fence them, but they never can. They, we always say the true art and art theft is not stealing the art, it's fencing it. And it becomes impossible, but I will say this. Again, she's unique because what had happened was a year before, uh, these two very famous IRA operatives, the Price sisters, again, trailblazers in their own right as female um, IRA soldiers, um, the British would have called them terrorists. They were arrested and they were um, for bombing the Old Bailey, the storied courthouse in London. And they were locked up in a British prison and they went on a very famous hunger strike demanding to be moved back to Belfast to serve their time as political prisoners. Rose Dugdale stole these paintings from the Rossborough House in an attempt to uh, trade the return of that art for the return of the Price sisters. Uh, surprisingly, and uh, Rose had to be taken aback by this, the Price sisters, through the media, urged that those paintings just be given back. They wanted no part of this. And in fact, Dolores Price um, was an art lover and had seen these paintings and really requested through her dad that um, the paintings be returned. Go figure, right? You'd think that right. was the perfect trade. Uh, and lo and behold, the Price sisters un undo her, quote, good, uh, good <laughs> efforts on behalf of them. Um, t uh, talk about what you, what was the most surprising thing? Y you've studied, I, I don't want to say thousands, maybe it's thousands, but certainly hundreds of major thefts. What was the most surprising aspect that you learned in developing this book? Thank, thank you for that question, because that's why I wrote the book, Josh. What I learned in researching her, uh, I have looked at thousands of art heists, and they're usually a one-off. It is incredibly rare for someone to steal art more than once, especially masterpieces, because just as we um, just mentioned, they're so hard to fence, almost impossible. She, uh, this was her second um, art theft for which she had received a conviction, but in the book I argue there was a third um, about a month before the Rustboro House was robbed, a museum in Great Britain called the Kenwood House was robbed of a Vermeer called the Guitar Player, an amazing painting. And no one, the painting was recovered, but no one was ever arrested for it. And the thieves who took that for a short time, uh, guess what their motive was? The return of the Price Sisters. Um, <laughs> There, there is a great, uh, I, I make the argument in the book that there's a great reason to believe that Rose Dugdale uh, was behind that art theft as well. So for someone to pull off multiple art heists is amazing. For someone to steal Vermeer twice is unprecedented. So that's one of the things that made this uh, an important book to write, I believe. And what was her demise? What was her, her fate? Incredible. Um, she wasn't a, uh, she, she, had a smart plan to go in and steal the opera. She didn't have a good plan for the aftermath. And she went to a place in Ireland where she stood out like a sore thumb. She figured going to this secluded um, rental property would uh, be a good hiding spot. But people recognized right away there was something amiss with her and the authorities were turned on to her quickly. Um, but her story doesn't end there. Remarkably, when she goes to prison, she um, gives birth. She, they find she's pregnant while she's in prison. Um, and she gives birth. She's the first woman in Irish history to have a baby in prison. So, of course, in Ireland, they figure, well, she has a child. We need to let her get married. So it's the first marriage in a prison in history. And then her husband, um, an IRA offshoot, decides, well, my wife shouldn't be locked up in a prison. So he goes and um, uh, takes an industrialist hostage, demanding her release. So... 
her life in about a three or four year span was so active that I've never seen anything like it. It was coincidentally happening at the same time as the Patty Hearst ordeal in the United States. Um, but far more remarkable because this woman was a willing participant. She wasn't kidnapped. She was the, the brainchild. Amazing. I was literally just about to utter Patty Hearst's name and see if there was a juxtaposition there. You, you hit the ball out of the park. Um, uh, this book might be the perfect reading for while you're in a pandemic. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the, the twists and tales, can't wait to read it. It's a must. You've also done something uh, really remarkable, which is you've built sort of a living history of the lost, uh, called the Lost Art Project which is this really interesting um, uh, episodic uh, analysis of a series of different thefts. Walk us through that initiative, that digital initiative, and where you hope to go with it over history. Thank you for mentioning that, Josh. You know, since I've been looking for the Gardner Museum paintings, and it's been 15 years, it's been <laughs> quite a journey. Um, one of the things I've uh, decided I want to do is educate people about the problem of art theft, because when I left Homeland Security to come do this job, I had no idea the, the breadth of what's missing out there. So I did everything from write books about it to, I even had this award-winning artist create an adult coloring book with um, a lot of the missing art. Now I decided to um, bring it digital and uh, created something called the Lost Art Project. It's at lostartproject.com. And what I plan to do is educate the public about what's missing and tell them my perspective as a security person and an investigator as to maybe what went wrong or the value of what's missing that you might not know about. Um, and in my own small way, hopefully educate the public about uh, the problem of art theft. You know, often people think of art theft as something that only affects the rich. Nothing could be further from the truth. Art in museums and such um, is there in, for an egalitarian reason is so everybody can go and enjoy it. So when you hear a, a major painting has been stolen from a museum, it's a crime against you. It's not a crime against the museum. So that's my goal, to educate people uh, through the Lost Art Project. Um, a couple, uh, let's go uh, uh, quick questions. Will we ever get, uh, will the uh, stolen 13 pieces ever be recovered for the gardener? Well, I've been saying yes for a long time, so I know people are probably uh, starting to lose faith, but I haven't. I can tell you that we're working incredibly hard every day, and when we're done, I'll be back at it, and we always have leads to follow. I feel confident, just based on history, that these things do come back. There's a very good recovery rate for stolen masterpieces, and I think the time is approaching um, you know, a generation later uh, now that we will see these paintings. Again, I'm very confident in it. I, I can't remember if it's the Boston FBI office or the Boston U.S. Attorney's office, but the number one thing on their homepage uh, is that theft, and it is, I believe, their number one priority. You know, um, I was heartened when I, I came over to this job and saw how dedicated the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's office both are in helping us resolve this heist. Amazingly, you know, nobody's looking for prosecutions here. The goal is not to arrest somebody. The goal is to put the paintings back on the wall. And I know that my federal partners share this. And um, as taxpayer, I'm, I'm pleased to see how these dedicated public servants work really hard to try to bring back these cultural um, treasures. So uh, it's been it's been a, a pleasant experience working with the government, believe it or not. If you were to, and I don't want, obviously, you guys are working lots of leads on this, but is it more likely it's in a garage uh, in, uh, in Waltham, or is it more likely to be the art on the wall of a uh, Japanese industrialist uh, somewhere in the mountains uh, of Japan? I love that you said Japanese industrialist, because that's a term people only use when they talk about stolen art. <laughs> right, they, right. The, the perception is it's always bought by Japanese industrialists for their homes. <laughs> right. Once in a while, it's the sultan of you name the country. But, um, <laughs> but you're right. That's the Hollywood version. The reality is your first um, assumption that it's probably in a garage or an attic or a crawl space somewhere not far from the museum because thieves rob places, not just museums and art, anything, in areas that they know. 
They don't venture out to the unknown to steal things like they do in the movies. So it's stolen uh, most likely by local people, I believe, and probably hidden here pretty locally. When I say here, um, I say, you know, uh, um, urban areas of New England like Boston or God knows even Providence. So um, we'll look anywhere is the bottom line. But your guess, your first guess is probably the correct one. I think the first time we ever spoke was when we were unveiling the Patriarcha uh, FBI files. And uh, lo and behold, in one of the FBI documents was an exchange uh, off a wiretap relating to Raymond Patriarcha Sr. in his discussion about a missing Rembrandt. It predates uh, the Gardner. But uh, uh, these, these things do happen. And uh, in that case, there was some relationship to the Patriarcha crime family as to potentially who stole it and who disposed of that individual piece of art. Well, you were good enough to let me write something for the, for the uh, site. Um, and that, I'm glad you brought that up because it's perfectly illustrative. So you have a painting stolen, but it wasn't the mafia, right? And someone has this Rembrandt and they're looking for a way to get rid of it because, as we just discussed, it's incredibly hard. And also importantly, when it comes across uh, Raymond Patriarca's desk, he doesn't stand up and, and uh, exalt like, oh, my God, a Rembrandt. It's just another piece of stolen goods to them. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Right. So uh, you can see the way they reacted to it. It's nothing like Hollywood. It's much more interesting. Uh, Anthony Mori, I give you the last word. What else should people know? Well, I, I want people to go to my website, lostartproject.com, and subscribe. Um, and in November, my book, uh, The Woman Who Stole Vermeer, will be out, but it's on, it's on Amazon now for pre-sale. Um, but I thank you very much for this time, Josh, and uh, I love the site. Yeah, no, we appreciate it. Always, uh, you know, you could be that Dos Equis guy, one of the most interesting men in the world, Anthony Amore. Thank you so much, and we'll stay in touch uh, as things develop. Uh, for everybody else, stay tuned. Uh, Dr. Michael Fine, 12 noon, Governor Raimondo, 1 o'clock. Uh, everybody, in the meantime, please stay safe.